So we collected all this data, and what did we find? The most important thing is just to have a look at the test scores. So these two graphs show the test scores. The top graph is the primary schools. The bottom graph is the secondary schools. The top graph shows those nine primary schools, which, trust me, you'll have to trust me on this, were not selected on the basis of their test scores. We didn't know what their test scores were going to be. We selected them on the basis of schools who'd been working with this approach and seemed to be making progress with it by their own account. So then we went looking to see what their test scores were. We have national testing at age 11 called Key Stage 2 SATs. All our children have to sit tests in English, maths and science. These are the aggregated scores, very simple graph, uh, just showing for these nine schools their total scores on these tests in the year before they embarked on uh, their Building Learning Power journey, the year in which they started on this journey, and the following two years. That's reassuring. It's saying if you invest more of your energies as a teacher and as a school in trying to build these habits of independent learning, inquisitiveness and resourcefulness and thinking how to unstick themselves and how to improve their own learning for themselves. If you invest in building those habits, your results will go up, not down. Now, you need that tattooed on your heart, right? Because the fear is that somehow or other, and this, this way of thinking often runs really deep, is that these two things are either or, isn't it? Either we're going we're gonna to play the standards game in which case it's a shame, but we are going to have to take our eye off the 21st skills agenda, or we're going to commit ourselves to helping kids really build attitudes for real life, but, ooh, is that going to mean that our test scores are going to go down and whatever follows, whatever is consequent on that. So this is really, really important. The most important thing that I want to draw your attention to in both these graphs is not that the test scores go up encouragingly. That's nice to know. The really, really important thing is they don't go down. Right? In other words, this is not a risk. It might feel like it, but it isn't. Particularly if you do this in a way that is sustained and gradual as a evolving culture change process. Let me talk about the secondary data. These are the schools divided into the, these are the individual schools and you see exactly the same thing. I, it's variable, you know, this is an honest depiction. This school went up and then went down a little bit. This graph, by the way, shows the, the, the sort of baseline year and then the year in which they started. This point on this graph is simply the, the latest year for which we have data. So this is not a linear scale along the bottom of here. But again, you can see what this graph shows is that it doesn't matter whether you're a high-achieving, selective grammar school in Buckinghamshire or um, Essex, which these two schools are, or you're a school that's really struggling in an area of high deprivation in the northeast of England, in Scarborough, you'll find that results tend to at least hold up and in many cases improve. We were particularly interested to find this test scores in high achieving schools also improve but the point I was making was the going up is a nice to have. The point of building learning power is not to raise test scores. The point of building learning power is to produce kids who are more confident and capable in facing real life uncertainty. Right? But it's really useful to know that if you focus on that your scores go up rather than down and at least they hold up, they stay the same. So it's like, it's quite important to understand what the function of this data is. Uh, yeah, and as I was saying, individual schools' journeys are a bit rocky. Sometimes, you know, you get a rough, troublesome group of kids going through the school or a key champion of a particular approach leaves and is replaced. You know, schools are real places, so you never get kind of perfect smooth. Also, you can, never, you, know, you can never draw strong causal conclusions because all kinds of things are changing simultaneously in a school. But I would argue that this data is, at the very least, strongly reassuring, isn't it? 
if you're worried about this, you know, that this is taking your eye off the standard sport. And, it's, you know, and we have a lot of qualitative data which shows from teacher observations and interviews with kids that the more you invest in helping the kids not, not mind making mistakes, feeling comfortable with difficulty, not immediately feeling stupid and helpless, but being able to take a deep breath and say, what else could I try? What do I know that could help me? Investing in building that degree of practical intelligence in the face of difficulty. It's not that surprising that if you're even a small bit successful at doing that, the kids take those attitudes into the exam room with them. And we have lots of reports of teachers saying, you know, our kids did well because they did their best. They didn't freeze in the face of these tests. They were able to keep saying, how, how could I do it differently?